I did get brush. I did comb my hair this morning, I think. Does it look like I combed it this morning? Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. The Adam God doctrine says that Elohim and Jehovah are two separate beings. However, according to the documentary hypothesis of the Bible, Elohim and Jehovah anciently were used interchangeably for the name of the one true God. So how do Christ Church Apostle David Patrick and 70 Benjamin Schaefer deal with that issue? Check out our conversation. Hey, I just wanted to mention one other thing. Beyond the Blocks is an awesome podcast, and it seeks to center the narratives of the marginalized in conversations on Mormonism. A black lifelong member and queer theologian, Brother Jones and Brother Knox, seek to fill the gaps between Mormon theology and Mormon culture that find all kinds of identities may claim a seat at the table of Christ. So check out Beyond the Block. It's a great podcast. Now back to our conversation. Okay, so I want to bring in uh, the documentary hypothesis. Are you guys familiar with that? The documentary hypothesis of the Adam God doctrine? Of the Bible. Okay. Okay, so no. you're not familiar with it? So here's, here's, the, here's the thing that I want to bring up, and, and I want to hear what your response is. Because basically, as I understand the documentary hypothesis, and I still need to get David Bokovoy on, because <laughs> he understands this way better than I do. But as I understand the Adam, excuse me, the documentary hypothesis, um, the idea here is the first five books of Moses were written by four different authors. Right. Yahweh, okay. J, the J author, because he refers to God as Yahweh, E for Elohim, uh, because the idea, and this is the point that I want to make here, so you've got basically in the, in, and I might be getting this backwards, in the northern kingdom they referred to God as Elohim, and in the southern kingdom they referred to God as Jehovah, and then the editors, according to the, the um, documentary hypothesis, combined them all, and that really Jehovah and Elohim are really two names for the same person, for the, for the one and only God. And if you sure. go to the Hebrew, they basically alternate behind, between Jehovah and Elohim as the same person. And so Mormons are heretical because yes, we, we say that Jehovah and Elohim are two different people, but historically, especially in the, in the five books of Moses, um, they believe that the, I hope I'm getting this right, the southern kingdom referred to Jehovah, the northern kingdom referred to Elohim, but they're really the same person. So how would you respond to that issue? Textual criticism is a big rabbit hole to go down. Yeah. A big gospel tangent. It right is. There. And that's why I'm trying to get <laughs> um, David Bokovoy on. <laughs> sure. Um, and, and it is complicated, but I do have a couple things that I, I, I could say to that. Um, first of all, we do believe in this unity of godliness. Uh, Jehovah is an Elohim, is, is an El, right? Um, these are different titles, as, as David is explaining, right? That you can use those titles, and sometimes you can use those title, titles somewhat interchangeably. This is actually another evidence for the Adam-God doctrine. If, if Michael, as a title of God, with God right in the name right there, um, then you could call any of them by any of those titles w without being incorrect. Um, but uh, and there's but uh, a tangent here uh, is that uh, this 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 textual criticism brings up an interesting question as to whether or not under the reign of Josiah the Deuteronomist wrote the book of Deuteronomy rather than discovered it. Yeah, that's um, the D author there. The, the D author there, um, and but I and I think that this relates uh, really interestingly um, if that theory holds true as to what happened in the Book of Mormon, the whole brass plates saga was apparently that Lay Layman. One uh, Laban, sorry, Laban, one of the elders of the Jews at the time, and it even says it says several times that he was one of the elders of the people, or that he was he met with the elders of Israel, and he had the care of these sacred things. Um, what were they meeting about in all these meetings? Apparently, while Nephi sneaking around the city, what are they all talking about? And and why is it that um, it's not an unreasonable request for Nephi to be like, oh, you know, what, the elders want to take a look at this brass plate, bring. He's like, oh yeah, you know, this is what we're doing. We're, they're apparently, at this time, they're all debating what the contents should be of the Torah, apparently. 
is the background to the Book of Mormon, which plays right into this whole textual criticism theory, is that they're all debating what, what should we include in the Torah, what shouldn't we include, while Nephi runs off with one of the most important primary sources. And everybody's like, oh no, now what are we going to do? Um, so it, it is kind of an interesting question. Um, Mormons, I think, are far more comfortable than mainstream Christians with this idea that the Torah um, or the Pentateuch, and as well as these other writings, did not come directly off the pen of Moses and in their purity have reached the modern no, day, right? We, we talk about, as far as it's translated correctly or tran transcribed correctly or transmitted to us, there, there, undoubtedly there have been some changes. Um, in general, I don't think that that completely changes the fundamental doctrine, though, from our perspective. So, so the question of what does Jehovah mean? Well, we believe that that's a, a, an essential title of God. It essentially breaks down into some of those questions of um, I am that I am, which is this like self-created statement or, or the idea that God is beyond time without beginning of days or end of years. Um, all of those are titles of God. They're all titles of godliness. They can be applied appropriately to any member of the Godhead. Any member of the Godhead also can speak for any other member of the Godhead. There's plenty of places where that gets confused, where someone will say, the Holy Ghost came upon me and I heard the words of God saying, behold, I am Jesus Christ. I'm your advocate with the Father. Um, and then he says, I'm the Father and I sent my Son into the world. Well, which one was speaking then? That's, that's all three. And it sounds like it's all one continuous statement. That's okay, uh, as far as I'm concerned, because not only are the titles interchangeable, but they speak. When one speaks, they're all speaking in unison, right? And there's this... Uh, idea of the unity of God. They are one. Um, in the great intercessory prayer, um, Jesus uh, says that he wants us to be one as they are one, of one heart, of one mind. This is what Zion is as well. So there's this goal, essentially, that anyone can speak, and it's the voice of all. So there's the monotheism-polytheism dichotomy kind of played out. <laughs> Yeah, and I want to go on a different tangent for a second. There's a reason why we call it tan gospel tangents. Yeah. Um, in, in Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, there's a footnote in the intercessory prayer, and it's the only gospel where it appears, mm -hmm. and that the, an angel came, and it was an archangel. And during this, the most important prayer ever uttered, on the earth, the intercessory prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane by Jesus Christ, the footnote notes the archangel comes. And in the Doctrine and Covenants, it notes that Michael, or Adam, is the archangel. Now who else would come to Jesus Christ at the most important time in his life, the most important prayer in his life, but God the Father that he was praying to? And the footnote even recognizes it as the archangel. And I've actually seen, uh, I should look it up, there's a beautiful art, there's some LDS art about this idea that Adam was there in the garden strengthening Jesus for his great sacrifice. Um, how much sense would that make um, for Jesus to be strengthened by someone lesser in authority than someone higher in authority? And so Adam coming to the garden, as it says in LDS in a bunch in several LDS writings and even in LDS art, it, it, the whole point is that the Father was hearing and answering his prayer. He was there with him in the garden. Um, the Father, you know, was was there with him, saying, you know, I've gone this way before, and I'm going to carry you through this. So, so let's talk again. Let's just kind of recap and make sure that we're um, we're back on here. So we've got. We've got the chart here, and why don't, why don't you just read off the chart? And... Sure. All right, so we've got Elohim, Jehovah, and Michael. Then, below Michael, then, we would have the Godhead of this world, which is Michael, Jesus, and the Testator, the Holy Ghost. And isn't it interesting also that in the beginning of time, was Adam or Michael. And then in the meridian of time was Jesus Christ. And at the end time, the Holy Ghost or testator comes. And I think that's a, an interesting setup, uh, subtle, mm -hmm. but uh, something that, that people that like symbology are going to appreciate. Now, the Elohim up here at the top, Jehovah and Michael. So we've got 
our Father God at Michael, his grandfather God, and great-grandfather God. Now, we'll also say God the Father. Uh, Michael is God the Father. And then Michael's God. And the Council of the Gods. So it's all put in perspective. And then you've got the Savior, which is Jesus Christ, the Savior or Messiah. And then you have the, the Testator, uh, the one that testifies of the Father and the Son. And then in, as the Holy Ghost. And now you've got this, this simple hierarchy you can follow. And it puts it back into perspective. And I'm like, oh. Uh, and of course, I didn't get it when I, you know, was very first at yeah, this. Yeah, I love that chart. I, that was like the thing that I was just, it, it just clicked with me. It made a lot more sense. Yeah. Um, and, and and now I'm not so worried about this this conundrum of thinking Michael or Adam is subservient to to Jesus because he's not. He's subservient to Jehovah, which is true. That's a title in the priesthood, and 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 it will never say in the temple this is Jesus because it will always say Jehovah. At least they we expect that they'll stick to that, mm-hmm. and um, and that's right. Well, the thing that that sticks out in my mind there's actually two things. Number one. I'm always amazed at how many, not, not a lot, but I get, I get some comments from people that are like, I'm a never Mormon, I'm a Christian, um, and so I'm always amazed, like, why are you interested in my podcast? <laughs> like, I'm so grateful, but, but I don't understand. So I know for the, for the, especially like an evangelical Christians that are out here, or Catholics or whatever, Protestants, they're just sitting here and being like, you guys are so polytheistic. <laughs> And so does that not, I mean, when I asked that earlier, it didn't seem like that really bothered you guys to be called a polytheist. Is that, is that true? As long as we're following hierarchy, yeah, not yeah. a problem. Yeah, you know, I, I think the thing is, is that I, maybe I'm just not too concerned about some of those labels. Uh, Mormonism is to embrace all truth, come from whence it may, which basically means that as soon as you put God inside a box and you said, this is it and that isn't, I don't know that that's real true Mormonism anymore. The original Mormonism is that we're going to embrace all these truths. Polytheism might be one way of looking at God. Monotheism might be another way of looking at God. Um, But uh, we can embrace the truth that underlies both without necessarily being limited by labels, I think. Well, and I'll I'll happily go to another tangent. Um, When the evangelicals want to come to the Manti pageant or something like oh, that. Yeah. And favorite. they, you know, want to engage uh, our, our Latter-day Saint brothers and sisters. Just do it in a Christian manner is all I ask. They're so disrespectful. It's like, how can you call yourself a Christian? Like, that just bothers me to sit to know it. Well, we, we recognize that. And, and so we send our elders there to help. I don't know. Break them in. <laughs> we break our elders in there. Oh my goodness! As well as we try and you know take the pressure off of our Latter Day Saint brothers now, are and these sisters. Like eighteen, nineteen year yeah. old elders. Absolutely. Yeah, and it was sort of kind of a counter protest. We kind of defend Mormonism, and that takes some of the pressure off the LDS people just trying to attend the pageants. Well, but that's they, nice. they will. Um, they they. And will, they think you guys are just LDS, right? Well, well they assume we tell that. Them. We, they assume that at, at first, but yeah. but when the evangelicals want to come out and then they want to throw down, well, see what Brigham Young said about Adam God and our, our four Latter-day Saint brothers and sisters are clueless. Yeah. They don't know anything about that. And they're like, Brigham Young would never have said that. You must be misquoting. But he wasn't misquoting. He really did say those things, right. as others, many mm-hmm. others. And so um, the evangelical is pretty happy. Well, I got them, right? You know, I showed them and... Um, and the look on their faces <laughs> when I go, oh yeah, I believe that, and they're like, wait, you believe it? Uh, yeah, then, yeah, that, that's what I believe. It. And then we defend it and explain our position, and uh, yeah, they're always they're always shocked because that's what they're going for is the shock value, and then it's kind of fun to watch them be shocked instead. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the tables. Right. So so here we have this uh, opportunity to talk to evangelicals, and, um, and we just take the wind out of their sails. We just we just do, and, and that's okay. We like doing that, and we like doing that for the sake of our Latter Day Saint brothers and sisters as well. Huh. I hope you enjoyed a conversation with Benjamin Schaefer and David Patrick of Christ Church. In our next conversation, we'll talk about another way to think about the Godhead. So I 
instead of seeing it like a triangle, I kind of want to turn it three-dimensional. And when, if you turn a triangle three-dimensional, all you see is the line, right? But I'm saying the Godhead isn't a two-dimensional shape. It's a three-dimensional spiral. So that as it goes down through these generations of the gods, the Godhead, yes, you can view it as a triangle if you're thinking two-dimensionally. But if you're thinking three-dimensionally, it's more the God's ways are one eternal round, as it's described. And so then there's no problem with there being multiple generations of the gods. Elohim, Jehovah, Michael, Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, and essentially, by theory, on and on. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview and you can also get uh, transcripts available in either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button of course we're also on Facebook Twitter and all the other places uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents and don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.